listening to the Field Ethos Podcast, the global hunt for adventure, bringing you stories and interviews from adventure seekers, hunters, anglers, and the outdoor-minded. This episode of the Field Ethos Podcast has been sponsored by Swarovski Optic, Ultimate Performance, Perfectly Designed. Those two phrases best describe the rifle and spotting scopes built by Swarovski Optic. Swarovski optics are designed to blend seamlessly with any hunting firearm, providing optimum detail recognition, uncompromising image definition, and exceptional viewing comfort facilitating rapid target acquisition. Visit SwarovskiOptic.com to learn more. Want content exclusives and the best in pro deals? Subscribe to the Field Ethos weekly email list and receive regular updates to include exclusive content and offers selected by the Field Ethos staff. You can learn more by visiting fieldethos.com. Hey guys, this is Jason Vincent with uh, Field Ethos Podcast. Tonight we have special guest Lucas Hanley coming to us from Australia. Lucas is a freediving aficionado and breath-holding expert. Um, Last week, Davis and Jay, uh, I'm sorry, Davis and Don jumped on a um, Zoom meeting with Lucas and worked on some breath techniques, and they felt like it was a pretty incredible experience, and that there was a lot of application for hunters and outdoorsmen in general. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to let Davis take charge of this one tonight because um, the water is Davis's domain. Don also is uh, is very much comfortable in the water and is a big-time free diver. Most people don't know that. So Don and Davis are going to kind of take it away tonight. And, um, and and talk to Lucas, and we hope everybody enjoys this conversation. Good deal. Well, Lucas, welcome. Um, I actually got to give credit to Don because though I might have been held underwater for quite some time, he definitely uh, whooped all of us on the on the breath hold course that we took with you last week. So well, it, it was fun, and uh, you know, Lucas, I want to thank you for doing that. I mean, it really, uh, you know, I, I sort of. I'm, I'm really into the spear fishing and free diving and, you know, trying to do it, but, you know, still pretty much a journeyman. And mm-hmm. I was amazed what, you know, literally a couple hours, even on the phone and video conference, you know, uh, you were able to accomplish with my abilities. I mean, literally adding, you know, probably, you know, 45 seconds or so to my max hold. Uh, mm-hmm. And that was after downing about two Red Bulls right before we started. So I wasn't exactly in the, uh, uh, you know, the, the best physical shape to be doing a lot of breath holding because they had one of those long days uh, and I wanted to make sure I was alert. So uh, blowing a PR out of the water by a lot, uh, despite all of those potential limitations was pretty incredible. So, yeah, I would say you guys did really, really well there. I am. Um, I mean, you, you had a couple of distractions there to, to put up with too, Don, which uh, you, you managed yeah, to Yeah, I, I had a, a, an annoying girlfriend trying to get me into dinner, and she literally walked in every time as I'm in, like in minute two of a breath hold, and I had the dog jumping on my face and crotch as I was lying there on the couch. It was, uh, yeah, it, it, they didn't make it easy for me, but we, we persevered. So you did for, well. For guys that are a little curious what we're talking about, Lucas has been conducting online courses. Now you've been correct me if I'm wrong, you've been teaching for ten plus years for free diving, breath holds, spear fishing, kinda of all of the above. Yeah, yeah. So my, my background was I mean, I grew up spear fishing and, and uh sort of moved into more, I guess, trained competitive free diving at sort of fairly young age and I started sort of teaching uh the application of that for big wave surfers. And, and, you know, those people wanting a bit more of an understanding of, of you know, the ocean and what we can potentially, the situations it can put us in. And then moved more into specific freediving instruction. Uh, opened the school, my personal school, about yeah, five, six years ago now. Um, I've been sort of teaching, yeah, every, every week since. And then just the craziness that is the, the current world situation with COVID and what have you you've been conducting some online courses and that's what we're referring to. I think we ended up taking a, uh, we came up on three hours. It's supposed to go for three and that's again, my fault for cutting our time a little short, but uh, man, it flew by and we're Don and I were talking offline afterwards and we're like, man, I think we could have probably gone for another out, couple hours. It was really informative and very helpful. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I think people get a, a heap out of this, this, these courses. Um, 
kind of because, you know, like a lot of people want to get into these activities and, and people go out there and say, you know, I enjoy sort of being in the water. I enjoy sort of spearfishing or enjoy hunting. Um, and then when you start to delve that little bit deeper, you start to learn a bit more about yourself and, and how to, how to, you know, extend yourself. And, and once people find um, that they're unlocking these abilities, it's, it's a rabbit hole that you kind of get lost in. And, you know, I, I see people, you know, lose track of time and that's kind of the point of it, isn't it? That, yeah, you're exactly 100%. right. hundred percent. And that, well, that was what was so cool about me. Like I said, three hours flew. I thought we were in there for an hour and, you know, my girlfriend kept coming in being like, it's 1030. You haven't had dinner yet. Uh, <laughs> and, and it was amazing. But I think what was perhaps, uh, you know, more shocking to me, I mean, I, I tend to think like I learn, you know, by being out there, by doing it, and you're just going to learn by, I learned more in three hours on an internet lying on a couch uh, than I did, you know, the last, you know, two summers in the water. Uh, and, and I think that was something that's, you know, really rather unique that you could better yourself uh, so significantly, not actually even doing the activity, uh, but just, you know, sort of taking a, a, a step back, not being in the water, not having those distractions, not looking at the pretty fish, uh, but literally being on a couch in your living room and and still being able to make gains in a, you know, rather extreme sport uh, that we weren't even doing. Yeah. I mean, a lot of people tend to focus on the physical nature of things. And, and it's very easy to get kind of caught up with like wanting to be, to be stronger and stretch further and, and sort of work on our, ourselves physically. Um, I guess one of the things that we often uh, we miss is the importance of working on ourselves psychologically and mentally. And I think that was a really cool thing. Like, I mean, I, I, I take my hat off to you, Don. Um, watching how, you know, you interpreted that, that sort of um, – the potential to be triggered by our own emotions and then logically breaking it down and, um, and applying all the techniques to really, really fortify your mind. And, you know, I think that's a really, really important uh, process of any, any sport that we do. And so, you know, that's, that's what we're trying to offer here in, in uh, online. That's, that's probably one of the hardest things that I try to tell people about when they're like, why, why, why do you like to, hold your breath and dive down or do whatever. Like it's extremely uncomfortable. What, what is it? And it's the, it's exactly what you're talking about. It's all the introspective stuff. It's the, it's the challenge of it. It's the accomplishment. It's you against yourself. And if you can kind of uh, master your mind, you can do a lot more than you think you could. And, and obviously that was a, that was a big factor with a lot of, mil- well, any military training for that matter. And it's one of the things that I think I really relished and enjoyed and what brought me, to free diving. Of course I hated free diving when I was in the military because I was being told I had to do it. And now I, I seek it out for my own personal satisfaction. I think what originally got me back into it was, I think there was a, it was a book called, oh, is it, is it Nestor? Is it, do you know who I'm talking about? It's Brad Nestor uh, called deep. So, so, uh, I think I, I think I know the book you're referring to. Yeah. I hope yeah. I'm getting the name right. I could be way off, but it was basically a guy that was a, a, a writer for outside magazine. And he was like, well, I'm going to go see one of these free diving competitions because of an assignment he had. He thought it was something that people pretty much talked about at cocktail parties. Right. And and then he gets there and the first couple of people are coming up with like bloody noses and blood coming out their ears. He's like, this is serious. And then he got, he got really into it and he starts talking about all of the, you know, the, the rabbit hole that is our, you know, the mammalian dive reflex and all the stuff that goes into who we are and and where that is before I get into all that, I wanted to get a little bit of your history and just kind of, I know you've got a a cool past and I really don't know much about it, but maybe we start there before we delve off into all these tangents. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you want me to just sort of ramble or do you want to ask? Yeah. I mean, I guess, I guess what, obviously you're in Australia, so you're you're kind of got water all around you so I can see what drew you to it. But uh, I know you got, you got into it at a pretty young age or was it Nat Geo that you started working with or? Uh, so, so, I mean, I got into it as a kid. Um, I mean, I, grew, I was really, really fortunate to grow up uh, sort of surrounded by the bush and the ocean. And um, I guess having that there at my doorstep um, and parents who were like, you know, get out there, get into it. You know, like, you know there was no sort of um, encouragement to get into TV and IT sort of stuff. It was all like get back out into the bush and, and connect with it. Uh, I sort of wanted to explore my own abilities as a young, as a young guy. And, and, um, that led me into the ocean and, and sort of exploring that. And, um, I kind of found that, 
you know, I was, I was pretty, I was good at it. You know, I'm, I mean, not by comparable standards now, but you know, like I, I, I could catch my own fish and that was kind of exciting to do. And, and then when I started having some, you know, bit interactions with sharks uh, and I kind of realized early on that, you know, that wasn't like, it was cool, but it wasn't like that big a deal. They weren't really what people made them out to be. It was sort of this thing where I guess as a, as a young teenager, people thought I was a bit crazy. You know, they'd sort of see, I'd come in and I was like, oh, you had all these sharks coming up and, and like now looking back at what it's, I mean, it's not that big a deal to have sharks swim up around you, but for most people at the time, they kind of get this idea that it's, it's nuts. And, um, and that kind of elevated my want to pursue that, you know, there's kind of a certain uh, reward for doing something that other people would feel uncomfortable doing. Sure. And so that sort of led me into sort of exploring. I know that. a little bit about that myself, just being, being into the stuff that, that I'm into and being New York city. I get a lot of that. Wow. You're actually in. So uh, I, I can relate Lucas. Yeah. Yeah, it is. I mean, we, we've, we've kind of progressed in society to a point where we're, we're very insulated from our natural environment. And, and when you actually actively get back out there now, it's, 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 it's kind of a weird thing when you think about it for that to be unique. Like it, I don't think it should be, but it's kind of the reality that a lot of people find themselves in. And, um, and so, I mean, that was something I thought, you know, I really love this. It feels natural to me. If I, if I get a reward from um, being able to explore the abilities that I, that I was born to, to have. Um, and, you know, that kind of led into, you know, pushing further and deeper and, and, and seeing where that could take me, both at, like in the environment and from a career perspective. Uh, so I guess my background is, that, I mean, I went. What things I, I did. Sorry, you. you... Oh, I, I'm sorry. Yeah, just a little, a little bit of the lag uh, going down to Australia. Uh, I was going to ask you about one of the things that was kind of interesting to me is that that exploring mentality that you're touching on now, it wasn't just about the deep. Uh, hmm. uh, you actually have quite history, you know, exploring some pretty remote areas on land as well, which I thought was kind of cool because you, you don't see that so often today where someone's, you know, an expert in one thing and they're just clueless at virtually everything else. Uh, you, you got some pretty cool and relevant to certainly the field ethos, you know, sort of listener. Uh, some of the adventures you've done on land as well. I'd love for you to get into those too. Sure. Yeah. Well, I mean, that's kind of where this journey took me, you know, once I sort of had this, found this love for um, being immersed into our environment and being able to live from it. Um, I kind of like went, went after those sorts of experiences and, and, and I sort of seeked out sort of the, uh, the cultures that still lived, off the land or in connection with their environment. And so I kind of, I did some, um, some really, really cool adventures through uh, the remote parts of Indonesia, um, up into uh, Malaysia, over in Thailand and out, out into the, the Indian Ocean there, and then all through the Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea. And, and, and wherever I went to, you know, like I kind of went like right off the beaten track. You know, this is kind of jumping on a cargo ferry, for a couple of days to get out to an island group to then live in a hot electricity and gutting with the locals. But you kind of, you know, if you don't catch food, then you go hungry. Um, I think, you know, living like that gave you a real appreciation for not only your own, your own abilities, but also how connected you have to be to the environment um, to survive in that kind of, that kind of place. Yeah. Hmm. So yeah. I guess from that, those sorts of experiences, I went on to write something, um, a, a, a TV series, you know, as a, as a young kid, you kind of have this, this dream of, you know, showing the world this kind of stuff because it's important to you. And I, I sort of wrote this, uh, this series about the, the communities that live off the ocean and how their worlds are sort of are changing. And that went into uh, sort of development with Discovery Studios. You know, we worked on that pretty hard for, for quite some time and, you know, nearly got to the point where everything was up and running. And, and unfortunately, you know, they had a direction change the last minute. And so it never really, never really got to screen. Um, but then I get, I, after that, I sort of worked on a couple of other projects too. So I had a movie uh, that we did and, and that was sort of again on the world's oceans and how they're sort of changing and, and um, that went out throughout cinemas 
throughout the world. It actually ended, it ended up on in the, in the States, I think, on iTunes. Um, so that one sort of, again, you know, like it's, it's, there's different facets to that. That's a sort of, it's a very, it's, a, it's an environmental kind of based film. Um, it sort of looks at potential impacts. Uh, it mixes a few different perspectives on things, which is pretty cool too, which I think is really, really important in, in discussions about our environment. I guess that's where my career has led me now. So I'm kind of just trying to get people immersed into it, have an appreciation for it and kind of get people to find that love so they can talk on common grounds. That's important to me. Right. And what's that film called, Lucas? It's called Blue. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, I've actually heard of that. I think I've seen that uh, or, or, or seen the uh, previews for it. I haven't wa- watched it yet, but I will now. Yeah. Yeah. Like, again, there's some things in there that, that I guess some, some people will, will not necessarily agree with. Um, some people might, it might make sense to people. Um, I guess the important part in me being a part of that film was, was sort of going, well, you know, we're, we're all a part of this thing. And if we can uh, work together on particular issues, then, then that's for the benefit of everyone. You know, I come in from a spear fisherman and, and, um, and uh, sort of a hunter's perspective. And I, I, I think it's really, really important to have people as a part of the environment uh, because those people are the most likely to kind of want to stand up and protect it. Um, but I also recognize we have to kind of work with all groups for that. You can't sort of, you can't end up with good outcomes if you sort of throw rocks at the people who you don't necessarily agree with. So, sure. you know, that's, yeah. that was, that's I, for me, that was why I kind of, I was a part of that film. Yeah, that's interesting. And I would think there's probably quite a bit of that, uh, again, coming from a free diving and, the, you know, the diving world and, you know, free diving and regular and scuba diving are probably different, but then you throw in sort of the spear fishing side of things, uh, you know, and I imagine that creates, uh, some conflict for uh, w- within the community. I imagine, you know, those things aren't just concentric circles that overlap entirely. I imagine there's groups that are sort of in favor and there's groups that are not so, and there's some that are understanding and there's some that are not. Uh, so that, that must've been interesting to sort of navigate as you've made a career, uh, you know, out of this. Yeah, for sure. Like, I think, I think you, this is a, it's a really sensible way of looking at it, Don. Um, you know, when like people are not always going to see things exactly the same. And, you know, there's some people who use the ocean in a particular way and there's other people who see it in a different and in a, maybe an opposite sort of way. And, um, you know, it has been a tricky thing navigating that sort of thing. I think, I think the most important p- thing we can do is recognize that there are different views on something and try and sit down together and, and come up with the best outcome. You know, and I, th- I think, you know, ultimately that for me is somewhere where we have room for both. You know, I, I certainly, the last thing I ever want to see is, some, is people being um, removed from their environment. Like I think hunting is kind of a natural process and, and I, I would certainly encourage people to be out there um, and recognizing the value of what we have. And for a lot of people that is being able to, to have a, you know, uh, get a living from it. Um, you know, feed yourself, feed your family, immerse yourself, get that sort of reward of being able to explore what it is to be human in that environment. Um, at the same time, you know, we kind of need to recognize that other people see it in a different way and make a bit of, a bit of room for, for them as well. You know, we get good outcomes for everybody. I think so. And I've seen that. I mean, I, w- one of the things I've tried to do is, you know, and I always say, and we've talked about here on the podcast before sort of being a mentor in some of those worlds and, you know, the world that I come from, I'm sort of an unlikely guy to have gotten into the hobbies that I'm into, whether that be hunting, fishing, spearfishing, whatever it may be. But I had people that sort of took me under their wing at various stages in my life and I got into it. So, you know, part of my whole thing is sort of, you know, paying that forward now, bringing people from my world into, you know, that part of the world, which is the non-suit boardroom portion of my world, which is probably where I'm much more passionate, uh, you know, and I've been able to do that and, you know, get someone from New York City and you Mm. take them, you know, shooting or hunting or even if it's the basic stuff. And it's amazing to me watching that transition in a few hours where people are, you know, bordering on vehemently against it. But it's like, okay, Don, I like you and I trust you well enough. You got six hours of my time. Let's let's see what happens. Uh, You you take that person on that first hunt or onto a range or whatever it may be. Um, Not one of those people that I've introduced that were that started off sort of anti uh, Mm -hmm. by the end of the day, weren't like. That was one of the greatest things I've ever done. When are we going again? 
And so, <laughs> you know, the, while it doesn't always appear that I'm that tolerant, uh, uh, I, I, there, there is an element of that. And I think you know, being open and welcome and trying to explain it there. And if, if someone's open to listening also from the other side, uh, mm -hmm. it's amazing the sort of the strides we can make and the, the boundaries we can cross, uh, you know, to really perpetuate and forward the thing that we're all so passionate about, even if we look at it from a different vantage point. One thing I want to interject here um, is that uh, I think maybe a little bit of an elephant in the room is, is that um, I think people look at you, Don, and they don't understand how connected you are to uh, our natural resources, the ocean, the woods, uh, just the, the big picture of conservation. Um, and one thing I've gotten to know about you over the last uh, couple of years is that um, you're not one dimensional about it. And you're always willing to have a conversation about it. And, and if everything doesn't line up with your own perspective, it's never a militant type of conversation. It's, it's exactly what Lucas is talking about. It's, it's uh, sit down and talk about this kind of stuff. Uh, come up with a good path forward with people that might have different ideas on, on sustainability and things like that. So um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's great to, to see um, people that, that, you know, do this for a living like Lucas, um, who are so passionate about it, uh, that understand that there's, you know, always a diplomatic and, and um, free dialogue available for, you know, how to, how to protect what we all love and things like that. And, and it's also good. The other side of that coin, coin is that um, you're, you know, Don, you're the same way. Um, you know, people see you in a certain light, but you're it, from a mentality standpoint um, when Lucas was describing kind of, um, you know, how people have different viewpoints. I, it, it sounded exactly like something, uh, a conversation you and I would have had, um, you know, not on the podcast is that, yeah, it's, there's, there's always going to be some kind of conflict around these, these natural resources because people are so passionate about it. And that's a good thing. Um, yeah. it's far better. It's far better than people not being passionate about it. Um, a hundred percent. And yeah, so many people Absolutely. have a, opinions but, you know, the reality is, you know, I can say this for me in, in, in the outdoor world, you know, it's actually where I, you know, I don't do, you know, free diving. So I talk about it at a cocktail party or sheep hunting. So I can, you know, do it, you know, once every 10 years and then talk about it for the next uh, 10 years. I mean, it's sort of the way I've chosen to live my lifestyle. So I think most assume uh, and so many people have opinions without having ever really immersed themselves in those things. So to be able to educate from the standpoint of, no, no, no. But whether it's you know Africa, well, I've been nine times into the bush, into the middle of nowhere. So, you know, I, I think you, you can bring a lot to the table if you're willing to have those conversations. So many people are afraid of, you know, some of the initial conflict, but I think those things can still be done uh, very respectfully. And, and, you know, people can agree to disagree, but I think you can open up a person's viewpoints uh, from actual experience where they may not realize you have as much as you actually have because you're doing it as much. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I guess, uh, you know, my, a lot of where I was sort of heading in my career um, was was definitely trying to get people into the environment. So starting up the school, teaching free diving, and now moving into, into teaching spearfishing. Because um, like, I'm a marine scientist by trade. Um, so I, I come at this from a very scientific perspective. Um, and I would also consider myself very much a, like a conservationist, but like in a utilitarian kind of sense. Mm -hmm. You know, like I think if you just lock people out, be very like the next generation won't have that contact. If you don't have the contact with something and you don't have the love for it, you kind of you see it as valueless. You know, you yeah. kind of don't like the people who who will uh, d deprived from being able to experience the ocean won't have that kind of that want to protect it because you know to them it's it's a nothing thing. So I think it's really really important for conservation to be able to have people in connection with things. And that's sort of where my career is sort of progressed now, you know, like getting people into it, immersing them in the experiences, like whether it is pure freediving or whether it's spearfishing, um, you know, like as long as you kind of inform yourself and you, you sort of uh, go after that passion, you know, in a, in a way that develops yourself further and your connection with that further, I think it's, it's a really good thing, you know? A hundred percent. Uh, maybe Lucas, talk to us a little bit about, you know, how, how you've been able to do this since, you know, you're doing this stuff online, sort of adapting to, uh, you know, what the world has thrown us over the last few months. L like I said, I, I learned so much in a couple hours from halfway around the world, you know, talk a little bit about that because I thought, you know, even, you know, the aspects that we talked about, 
it wasn't even so much, you know, about free diving or anything, but I, I thought so much of the mentality of, you know, sort of mind over matter, uh, fact over feelings, uh, you know, sort of, you know, <laughs> hey, it, 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 you know, it, it did, it set records for me um, in that, but I also think that it probably has other uses, um, you know, in, in life and not just outdoor pursuits, but I mean, I was thinking about, you know, that sort of, you know, the, the ability to sort of help, you know, guide your own uh, mind through, you know, adversity, through hardship, through discomfort. Uh, you know, it, it goes so far beyond free diving that I was like, wait a minute, you know, I, I'm glad I got a lot out of it for free diving, but man, I could incorporate this in 30 other aspects of my life that I think would really be important. Yeah, hundred percent. So I, I, I guess I, I, you touch on something that I have sort of been working with a bit too. And, and a lot of the people, my students aren't necessarily just in it for free diving. They come and do these exercises and they do this training for other aspects of their life. A lot of them are sort of, uh, in very high stress uh, environments in terms of like their corporate and business workspace um, where, you know, it's very easy to become overwhelmed with, you know, with, with fast paced, stressful situations, you know, things that, that really test out our threshold. And if we haven't prepared our mind to go through those sort of situations, we're flying blind when they do happen. You know, so it's, I know, and then from a military perspective, perspective, Davis, I mean, I've never been in the military, but um, I would assume that you practice something over and over and over and over again. So that when and if you're confronted with a particular situation that, that is highly challenging, you know what to do in that situation. We do indeed. And that's, that's a good point you bring up. I'm going to hand it right back over to you, but you know, in the military, they, they throw a bunch of external stressors on you, right? Like if you're, if it's a breath hold to tie a knot underwater, they're going to do that while someone's, you know, got your feet tied together is punching you the rib. They're going to add all sorts of external stressors, or if you're going out for land navigation or training or something like that, they're going to, they're going to hit you with as many other things, kind of uh, similar things. I think Tiger Woods father used to yell at him when he was swinging his golf, you know, doing his golf strokes and things like that. So that when you actually had ideal conditions, you were ready for all that other stuff, yeah. right? They couldn't actually shoot bullets at us. So they would provide all these other sort of external stressors so that you learned how to cope, recognize adrenaline and, and, and kind of focus and harness that to where you could work. And, uh, uh, yeah. your perspective and your take on it is, is, is very much more introspective. And that was kind of what, what we did people out were the guys that couldn't figure that out versus the guys that could figure that out. And so it was great hearing you talk about it because it's like, man, this is all crap. I had to learn on my own. It would have been so much easier if I had talked to you 10 years ago. Yeah. Well, I, I guess, yeah, you're touching on like, this has so many applications in, in so many different places. Isn't it? And, and Don, as you were saying before, you know, like this isn't just for free diving. Um, there are so many applications for the, the mental process we use for free diving in, in other parts of our lives. So I guess what um, I try to do with all the breath hold physiology and psychology um, is to first of all recognize that we are going to go through periods of anxiety and stress. Right? Um, we, we, can, we can think about that now, but yeah, you know what? I'm going to get to points. And if you're applying this to a hunting scenario, you know, you're going to get to a point where you're, you've either reached your threshold um, of, of, of comfort or, you know, that you're too excited or, you know, all these other different things that happen to us. Or if you're in a business situation and, you know, you're highly stressed with um, workloads and deadlines and, and, you know, I don't know whatever potential other stresses you've got on yourself. We need to recognize that our brains do have limits that they can, they can reach, you know? And if we start to recognize that to begin with, and we start to the process of, of, fortifying them you know and, and uh by fortifying i mean creating pathways for it to follow when they start to to feel stressed start to um respond negatively to um uh, the stimulus of stress then we can kind of then we can we have a, a plan to move through it uh, so with the breath hold sort of stuff that i'm doing it's not just that kind of waffly this is what you do and you're mindful about things. I get you to, to actually stress yourself out. We hold your breath. We dose your body with carbon dioxide, which as you guys experience is really uncomfortable. And under that discomfort, we start to change the way your brain's processing that information. 
And the more we do this, the more comfortable you become with processing that information in a positive way. Uh, and so that at the end, when you are exposed to these highly stressful situations, you have techniques ready to go that calm you down and start and help you look at logical answers to, to the problem rather than responding or um, reacting emotionally. Right. Even, I mean, and as easy as just the breathing in general, I think when I, I first got bit by the freediving bug. Once I had gotten out, I, I Googled someone and researched it a little bit. And they're talking about a three part breath, right? You're breathing in through your diaphragm, moving your stomach, then your chest. And then the last that kind of had like a little bit of a shoulder shrug, shrug. I guess it's a, a yoga technique or something. Well, I started trying to apply that like when I was out for a run or whatever, make sure that I was breathing out of my stomach and you, and using my diaphragm a lot. And you know, I'll be damned if it didn't take a minute off my mile times and stuff. Now I was pretty out of shape at the time. So it, every little bit helped, but, uh, it all around is very helpful. And then I also notice it with, with hunting, you, you might run up to the top of a ridge, a hill or whatever. And we practice this a lot in the military as well. There are breathing techniques and, and psychological techniques that you need to incorporate so that you can get ready faster because you have a very limited window in, in certain situations. Yeah, I think, you know, we have a tendency to trust, um, you know, the, the ideas that we come up with, you know, we, it's like, we own that idea. So we kind of go, you know, that's what the way I think about something. And therefore, you know, I think that that's correct. Um, and if we just do the same thing over and over, and we don't really go back and analyze it, we don't necessarily progress or, or analyze how correct the assumptions are that we come up, come up with. So if you ran around breathing the way that you always did and you didn't try something new, then you'd never really progress. You just plateau at the level that you are. And, and this is, if I take you back to some of the exercises that we did, when I got you guys to hold your breath and you felt like you were about to give up and you're like, you know what, I cannot hold my breath any longer. Um, aside from Don, who actually had a very, very logical response to, I said, why did you give up? Um, you guys said to me, oh, I felt like I, I, I needed to breathe. And that's a normal thing. You know, you would kind of just go, we, well, I felt like I, I needed oxygen and that's why I was breathing. And that's, you know, that's, that is at the time kind of a, a logical decision or we think that it's a logical decision to make. But it's only when we go back and start looking at the information that we can that we can get, we can determine whether that assumption that we've made is correct or not. And when we kind of challenge those assumptions that we've made, we realize that, well, wait a second, it's not oxygen. These little things I was doing in my head um, were actually holding me back because I, I believed I needed to breathe because I thought it was about oxygen. It, it has nothing to do with oxygen. And when we start breaking down our connection to those assumptions, um, we start to extend ourselves. Yeah. One of the interesting things that you maybe talk a little bit about what I thought was very cool that helped me because I, I tend to think of myself as almost hyper rational. I try not to make too many emotional decisions, even if it appears that way uh, on, on an outward effect. It, uh, you know, there, there's some rhyme or reason to much of what I do was when you did a breath hold and you put yourself on the pulse oximeter and, mm -hmm. you know, you, you were two minutes in and you were at 97%. Uh, oxygen left within and I was like wait a minute like you know by that logic uh you know you should be able to hold your breath for an hour so it obviously not but it it, it put such perspective uh, in terms of what most people would find as an outer limit uh you know of a breath hold and you you're you're, you're in the hobbies in terms of what's left oxygen in your body that's going to sustain life and stop you from blacking out and and that just sort of literally changed uh, it moved the goalposts of where I, I would even start thinking about discomfort just based on being able to look at it with reason. Yeah, yeah, a absolutely. Um, interestingly, before I, I go back to explain it, I, I had a conversation with one of the doctors yesterday and, um, and they, they explained the, our oxygen limits and how often they actually deliver oxygen if a patient uh, is... Um, Completely out. Like once a, once a patient is, uh, I'm not sure what the term they used, but essentially on the operating table, um, they don't deliver oxygen or they don't have to deliver oxygen sometimes for 20 minutes, half an hour. You know, the amount of oxygen you have stored in your body under the metabolic load that it's, that it's currently at um, has enough to, to sustain you for a very, very long time. 
Um, so our perception of, of how much oxygen we have um, is, is, is sort of grossly um, changed by our experience of carbon dioxide. And that's where, where we were sort of like playing around. We were kind of looking at, at our reaction. And you were saying, you know, there's, there is a tendency to make emotional decisions um, to carbon dioxide. And we kind of need to recognize the difference between an emotional decision and a logical decision. And when we feel a particular way about something, we tend to ask ourselves in our head, you know, do I want to continue holding my breath? And, 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 and most people feel uncomfortable and go, you know what, I don't like it. Therefore, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to respond in a particular way. What you did really, really well was you kind of recognize that although you're uncomfortable and we can be presented with uncomfortable situations all the time, we have the ability, the ability to have um, logical or uh, more information to make a decision with. And, and instead of asking yourself, do I want to breathe back in? You sort of ask yourself, can I continue holding my breath? And we looked at the stats, we looked at the information and then made a logical decision to continue holding your breath. So yeah, you were able to really, really well break down um, that, that sort of triggering emotional connection to, to pain and look at, um, making logical decisions, even under that really highly stressful situation, which is, is what we're, we're aiming to get to. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I was really impressed with the way that you, you handled that, Don. That was really, really, that was, that was an impressive on your, on your, uh, you can just go with that. Well, no, and it, like for me, it was, it was also awesome just to be able to do that because again, to incorporate this, you know, in my free time, I'm hunting, I'm fishing, I'm free down, I'm doing something. I mean, I think, you know, free diving sort of, you know, an incredible adventure that so many people can get into. And then you throw in a spear gun and, you know, uh, mm-hmm. e- even, even a lot of the green people I know, they may not ever go hunt a deer, but, uh, you know, they're going to eat a fish. And I don't think that, you know, so <laughs> I, I think it's such an adventure uh, that, that probably not enough people have tried to do because of the psychological notion of I can't possibly do that. And the reality is you can't. Uh, mm-hmm. you know, like, like anything in the outdoors, sometimes you just need to get over that hurdle and try it out. So, I mean, I think people can actually learn a lot, even just doing the online stuff before ever getting in the water, to sign up for your class and learn it. Uh, but man, I would recommend it to anyone. I mean, if you like, you know, the hunting or the fishing lifestyle, I mean, try free diving. Cause it's, you know, it, it's a, it's a total adventure. Uh, and it's a total rush that in many cases you can do, you know, right outside of a, uh, I sit into it because I'm out here in Long Island, uh, you know, less than two hours outside of New York City, uh, you know, and, and we're diving to the depths, chasing striped bass out here. And it's just an awesome experience that's so close. Uh, I, you know, I could never do that in hunting where you, you, you're driving hours or in many cases flying to different parts of the world. Uh, so I thought that was very cool and, and a great way for people to kind of perpetuate that outdoor lifestyle. Um, you just need to get over that initial hurdle, which is, you know, all in between your head. Yeah. And, and I, I think you, you touched on something there. I mean, there's a real, there's an excitement to it, but as, as you learn too, like we can't get too excited. You know, there's that knife edge between exhilaration and, and kind of meditation, you know, like if you get too excited, your heart rate comes up, your brain becomes too active. So you're kind of constantly checking yourself and, and, and how your body's responding to, to what your brain's doing. At the same time, there's this, there's a, there's a really, um, I'm not sure if you get it. Um, but for me, when I'm out and I go and spearfishing, there's obviously like I, for me, I don't, I don't go to the farm. I mean, I don't go to the shops and buy meat. Like I'm, I'm, I'm more of, I want to know where my food comes from. I want to know that it's of, uh, I can choose the size, the sex, the species, uh, and I know that I'm making a best decision about what I'm taking. You know, so yeah. I'm not really impacting anything that. Isn't, that doesn't need to. Uh, and aside from that kind of sort of aspect, there's a real exhilaration of being able to extend my own abilities. You know, I feel like I feel alive. You know, I feel yeah. like I'm putting myself in a situation and that, you know, sometimes there's sharks around. There's this, this whole kind of challenge of being in, a, in an incredibly sort of almost like a foreign but sort of natural environment um, in a way where I'm, I'm being really sort of pushed as, uh, as a human. Yeah, you know, and, and what we can achieve, and I get to go home with food afterwards. You know, that's that for me is like really that kind of um, that's the reward. You know, it's not just the fish, 100%. it's not just the hunt. It's 
It's the, the putting into practice all the techniques, like the psychology, the, the, the physical nature of it, the understanding of our environment and, um, and where you find these things, and then doing something that's healthy for you. And it can be extremely 100%. peaceful, you know, like the, the whole process. And once you get, get there and get comfortable and, and get into, obviously there are, there are certain situations that are less comfortable, but what are some of the things that you think about when you're under there to, to, to stay kind of in a almost, I don't want to say a Zen like state, but you do, you have to, I, I notice that I get a lot more tranquil when I'm in the water and it, and I don't know whether that's out of necessity because I'm having to keep my heart rate down and hold my breath for longer periods of time or what have you. But what are some of the things that you do to kind of focus on where you are and what you're doing and not get too hyped up like you're talking about? Yeah. So again, it's like, it's that, that interesting knife edge between being excited about what you're doing and knowing that you have to keep yourself calm. You can't get carried away with either one of those sorts of things. Um, for me, uh, and this is some of my favorite, favorite diving is like really deep sort of hunting you know well i'll be um some of the, the, the deeper fish that i've i've been sort of spearing have, have been between like 40 and 50 meters deep um wow. i'm not sure what that is in feet but you know well, it's, it's about that, of, that's about uh 120 to 150 120, feet, so 150 yeah that, that's 50 pretty- 50 yeah yeah, so it was three feet to a meter, 50 times, three, yeah, 150, 150 feet kind of thing. Yeah, that's the thing. And this is over in those little island groups where the uh, straight off the, the shore, it, it just drops to like the depths. You know, there isn't any kind of slope there. So you kind of have to go to that depth to catch those sort of fish. Um, and so there's quite a process to it. You know, it's not just sort of I'm going to go out there and, and dive to this to, uh, and just chase things around. You have to really prepare. You have, you know, your buddy on the surface who's watching your back and, and ready for you to come back up. Um, I go through like a sort of a – it's kind of like a, um, like a mantra. You know, I have like a thing, like a process that I sort of follow that uh, I follow nearly every time. And um, it kind of keeps your mind set on one particular task. Because if, if you want to do this at home, I mean, try holding your breath um, for as long as you can. And, and as you hold your breath, think of what happens to your mind. And generally what, it, what will happen is you start holding your breath. It's very clear. You have one particular thought. And as you progress through the breath hold, right, you start thinking of, you know, more and more things. And then by the time it starts to become painful and you feel like giving up, your brain is jumping from thought to thought to thought to thought to thought, to thought like really, really rapidly. And, and what this does, it burns up a lot of oxygen, um, produces a lot of carbon dioxide and increases that tension that we're holding. So I, I kind of give myself a task to do, um, a particular task that keeps my mind on track. Yeah, and, and sometimes I'll use uh, a, a bit of a, a story, a story that I'm very familiar with so that when I need to shut my mind down and not focus on all those other things that are happening, I will fill in the details of this story. And, and you can do it as simple as just like, you know, imagine leaving your house and as you leave your house and go towards, you know, a familiar place, you try and fill in all the different things that you see or experience between there and then. And then you tell, tell yourself that same story again, but you add a couple extra details. And, and this sort of thing keeps your, your mind focused on a particular task and not necessarily on the experience that you have, that's happening in your body. That's one of the things I do. I can imagine myself sort of free falling and you kind of describe the feeling to yourself of that free falling kind of feeling that way. You're not going, geez, that's painful. And Oh, what's that kind of feeling? So that's sort of, there's my secrets. That's yeah. That's really, that's really interesting. Hmm. Yeah. I've definitely always been a mantra kind of guy. I've done endurance sports in the past and uh, I have to have like a four or five phrase mantra where I'm just in that deep pain cave. Uh, I got to turn the brain off. I got to go back to the, the lizard brain and not pay attention to what's happening. Um, so that definitely works. I've I've experienced that in the past. Yeah, so, that's what Davis, was really interesting about the class, Lucas, was that some of the things that you know you could do. So even when I was at a point where I would have been at total discomfort, you know, some of the little things you were telling us to do at the time, able to do that, and it was like starting over. It was almost like I had just you know started holding my breath, and, and it, it just the resetting of all of that uh w- was really incredible and again I, the, the applications of that go so far but certainly uh as a related to you know free diving or spear fishing were just uh, amazing because you can do so much more once you can get yourself back in there and it, it was all in between your ears 
Davis yeah. was telling me, um, I guess maybe last week, Davis, we were talking about this and, and um, I can't quite remember exactly the context it was in, but um, you mentioned something we were talking about diving. Um, Davis and I are both divers and he said something about how he would get lost in his head thinking about things while he was on a dive. This is a scuba dive. This is, this isn't uh, a free dive that he would be down there and he would be thinking about these different things and, and what he was, what were we talking about Davis? Because I, it really, I was talking more, I think I was talking some about exercise, whether I'm just like swimming laps in the pool or people talk about that runner's high where you kind of get in a zone and you start thinking about things. I think about that a lot when I'm, when I'm swimming, but certainly on a dive as well. Cause it's, you know, the sound is pretty much shut off. There are sounds, but it's all kind of white noise. So it, it, like Lucas is talking about, you get in your head a lot. And right. obviously if you've got oxygen, you can kind of daydream or ponder about whatever. But when you don't, it, uh, I know exactly what he's talking about. Where you start but it just, it just spoke to, it just spoke to being able to, to be comfortable inside your head. Um, right. And that's yeah. something that a lot of people struggle with is being comfortable inside their own head when, when, you know, Honestly, I, I've done very few free dives. I've done some Hawaiian sling free dives and some some relatively shallow water and stuff like that. Uh, and I've, I've been paddy certified since I was 15. So I'm comfortable in the water. But a lot of people aren't. And the water just in itself is an external issue for them. Um, and, you know, when Davis and I were talking about it, I was all I could think about was his ability to block out everything else and just be super comfortable in something as foreign as water, which, you know, people don't, people don't think about it in terms of being something that's very foreign, but it's something you can't survive in. And if you can be very comfortable mentally there on a free dive at depth, things like that, um, there's a lot of application for being able to take those same mental principles um, when something is uncomfortable, when, when things around you are kind of going to shit. I mean, being able to stay comfortable inside your own head, um, and, and, you know, being in that comfortable mental place when things are, uh, things aren't comfortable. Um, it's, it's something that, uh, there's a lot of application there for people aside from just swimming. I mean, the, the breath hold techniques, the understanding that your mind can be stretched and that you do have control over, um, over your situation and, and, you know, being inside your own head. Um, man, that, that was what, I was more excited about when Davis told me about this class with you, Lucas, is that there was so much application beyond just free diving and, and it bled into hunting, but it bled into um, situations I've been in um, prior to, prior to getting into the journalism world that if you can just, if you can be inside your own head, analyze the situation, understand that, that um, you know, you, you're still in control. I mean, those, those things, uh, permeate throughout so many different areas of people's lives. I mean, people, you know, I think, I think if we live in, a, in, in an anxiety laden yeah. world and what you're doing is mastering that. Yeah. So what you touched on a couple of things here, and I want to just kind of clarify that for people who are sort of, um, sort of following along at, at home here. One of the things that you kind of, you, you mentioned was sort of blocking it out. And, and I try not to, um, to think of things as just blocking them out. Um, because it's kind of it's trying to ignore that, it, that 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 sort of part of our brain exists. I try to get to people to recognize that we do experience uh, anxiety and stress, but we are able to have um, methods to to comfortably deal with it when it pops up, and that's kind of what you're getting at there. When you know, if you recognize that you're going to have these experiences, um, you it's a part of who we are. Uh, and, and we have ways of, of dealing with it. And we're not just trying to just pretend that it doesn't exist. We're going, okay, let's, let's, let's find a way to be able to be in control of our own mind, be in our own head um, at all levels of, of anxiety or stress or discomfort. Um, and, you know, that, that's what we're, what, that's definitely, definitely what this whole sort of course is about. I wish, I wish I had something like that. I mean, I wouldn't have listened back when I was 18, but I think about how much more effective I would have been with high school sports or things that I did in college. Just, you know, my, my, my early developmental years probably would have gotten or retained so much more had I been able to process. And obviously that's part of growing up and part of, part of what you learn, but it was, 
it was something that I really learned in the military and you're, you're, you're hitting on it as well. It's, 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 it's recognizing the things that are coming in and processing them in a way we had, we was called the, the OODA loop in the military, which was you observe where you are, you orient yourself, you decide what to do and you act on it. And then you observe where you are. You, you know, you, whoever can do that process the fastest and the most effectively wins. And so, yeah. and it's a great thing just to apply to life, right? Like constantly observe your surroundings or observe what's going on with you or, and, and decide and act on it. And then and this is exactly what we're talking about with Don and, and um, being able to make a distinction between emotional and logical decisions. You see, when we get ourselves into a, an, a, into a period of stress and anxiety, we tend to fixate on the one thing that's creating that stress and anxiety. So, you know, we have an uncomfortable situation and, and we tend not to use like a, a, a peripheral view. As you were saying, you, I'm not sure the, the acronym you just used, but it was sort of like look around you and take in all the information. And this is one of the biggest sort of hurdles to overcome is, is that that sort of uh, innate response of, of um, reaction to stress, right? People, people react emotionally to, to these environments without necessarily taking that time to scan around, taking all the information to make better informed or logical decisions. Um, so, yeah, you're right. I mean, it, it is, it's both of those things. Yeah, exactly. And as you, you put it. I learned some of this a little bit the hard way as it related to, you know, free diving and spear fishing because, you know, I sort of grew up and did some of it in clear waters. Uh, but now <laughs> where I'm based and spend my weekends, it's cold water. It's, it's like uh, lentil soup half the time, uh, pea soup. You go down and it's amazing that, you know, in the Bahamas, you see 50 feet, you dive 50 feet, you're hunting, you're looking for lobster, whatever it may be here. You don't see bottom if you're in 50 feet of water. So diving down, you may be 10, 12, 15 feet down, and the stressors are already getting at such that this would be a nothing dive um, in different conditions. But you may not know that you're getting to bottom until you basically run into it. Uh, it changed the dynamic for everything. It made things so much to come up. You're like, oh, man, how deep is that? You're at 37 feet. I'm like, what? Uh, oh, I, I must have been down there for a minute. Uh, you were down there for 14 seconds. It, but everything changed just because of, you know, what, what my body was able to see. Whereas if it was a clear bottom in the Bahamas, no problem. You go down on time. Um, and, and all of those extra stressors were just, you know, based on what you were able to visually see. Yeah, yeah we, we put a lot of emphasis on, on certain senses um, and, and we, we like, you know, like our sight for us because, I mean, it's so important um, for, for, you know, hunting um, and being in there and feeling safe. You know, when that's restricted, uh, we naturally start to feel stress because, we, you know, we base our safety on being able to perceive the, the, the world around us. Um, this is a great example of being able to really apply um, that mental fortitude that you're building up. Absolutely. That, that's really going to test. People. And you throw in the cold, the discomfort. Um, yeah. And, and probably the anticipation of, of um, you know, being judged too, because you've got somebody on the surface there and you kind of don't really want to, you know, you don't want to turn around and be like, ah, oh, no, I got scared. <laughs> You know, well, so luckily, like, Lucas, I'm not at all competitive, so it's not a problem for me because, you know. I... <laughs> cool. Well, when's, when's your next outing, Don? What are you, um, what are you setting uh, you your know, target? Um, I yeah, mean, ho ho hopefully you... soon. Uh, you know, just got to wait for the, you know, the water temps are hovering in the mid-40s right now by us. And so uh, w one of the sort of winter, you know, spring winter species is sort of going out of season and we'll be getting into the striper should be coming up. Uh, you know, pretty soon. So we'll, we'll start making those journeys out there, uh, you know, uh, in the next couple of weeks. So I'm really looking forward just to getting back in the water, uh, uh, mm -hmm. hunting dinner and, uh, you know, having some fun. Uh, I haven't been able to do as much of those things these days because we've been sort of on lockdown with Corona. So uh, looking forward to getting uh, underwater and socially distancing from so many other people and just, you know, chasing some fish. You guys, you've there? been doing you're dry there? water tra you're, you're dry training now, so that you'll be prepared when it does happen. Hey, I, I you, uh, you know what would be interesting because I mean, a lot of what we do.
Yeah, I was going to say, I thought a lot about what we do, I mean, as well as, um, you know, personal development is also understanding how the species work. And, um, and you're sort of talking about the different seasons and how different fish come into, into play here. I mean, that's something that I really focus on as well. And um, the fish that I like to chase, the fish that, you know, that sort of give me that sort of feeling of having a real challenge um, require you either to go to depth like that, that are uncomfortable or to spend a long time on the bottom. And, and yeah. really have that preparation and that technique there. I mean, is there a certain technique to some of these fish that, that you know, like you've learned that require this kind of um, this mental fortitude? Don, is this about striper season for you and Dave? Is that what you're coming up on right now? This is going to be striper season, yeah. So it's a little different because, you know, I, most of my stuff is a little bit probably where you're talking about where you're looking under rocks and almost going into underwater caves. These are actually a little bit more of an open water fish. Uh, you know, mm-hmm. so what you're doing is, you know, you're sort of either end up diving into them. But again, you, you don't sort of see them till all of a sudden you're, you're in the midst of them. And so you got to learn how to make those decisions uh, as opposed to like if I was chasing grouper where I know, OK, I'm going to go under that ledge or, or certain species where I may just try to lie on the bottom and, uh, you know, do something or wait for them to show up to me. Um, you know, it, it, it's a little bit of a different dynamic than a lot of spearfishing uh, right now. But again, because of the cold and because of the just visibility, it, it, it's, uh, it, it's a whole different game here. You lost a little bit of audio there, Don, uh, for a second. But um, Lucas, just to kind of give you perspective on the fish and where he's talking about. Um, and, and I've caught a ton of striper. It is a very strong fish, um, it, very strong for its size. And we're talking, uh, you know, two foot, three foot visibility, um, four foot visibility, stuff like that. So um, it is a it is a fish that will give you a run for your money. I've never speared one. I've caught plenty of them. I know Jay has two up on Murray, but um, it is it it is a I mean, that is a, a, a fish that will give you everything that you're you can handle. Um, Don, is that. When is when is kind of peak striper season for you guys there? I've seen pictures of you doing this, but yep. I don't think we've really talked much about it. Sort sort of midsummer. I mean, we're we're you know they're starting to show up now. The school leaves are showing up now. Uh, you know, the bigger fish will show up. You know, start showing up in the next few weeks to you know middle middle June. Uh, you know, and then they'll be around for a little while. Uh, it just sort of depends. Uh, you know, there there has been uh, some damage done to the 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 striper schools over the last decade or so. So uh, they've put different restrictions on them now. So now we're not necessarily chasing, uh, you know, the biggest fish anymore, uh, which, which you're able to do last year. Now it's going to be sort of within a range and that that range is like a six inch range. So it's going to get pretty uh, challenging to do with a spear gun where you got to be, you know, it, bigger than this, but smaller than that in a, in a tight range. So, you know, the new restrictions that we're going to face and deal with, uh, are going to pose a whole nother mental challenge because you're going to have to try to make those assessments underwater, under stress, in bad visibility, uh, as, as opposed to, you know, last year where it's like, okay, I'm going to go, let's let's find the biggest one, um, you know, in, in the school. Lucas, what he's talking about is something we call uh, a fish slot. Yeah. So yeah. it has to be, I don't know if y'all call it a slot there, but um, we call it a slot and as a former game warden, I, were lo- I was looking for the dons of the world that were uh, – that we're shooting fish outside of the slot. And that is a, uh, that, that is a tough thing to judge um, is, is, is this thing in the slot right here. I can only imagine what it's like when you're free diving, but um, you know, I did, that must be a new regulation up there because I thought it was kind of biggest fish wins up there. It, it, it has been, uh, you know, now that said, I think, you know, that's also probably done some damage, right? So, uh, you know, and again, not just yeah. spear fishermen. Uh, yeah. I think spear fishermen, you know, the, the thing that's interesting there is you, you're going down to school, you can sort of choose to, you know, wh- what you're going for when you're regular fishing. Uh, you know, oftentimes the schoolies are getting to your bait or whatever it is that you're using uh, before, uh, you know, the, the big ones. So, you know, I think over the last few years that I've been doing it, uh, you know, the Spiros are probably getting the trophy fish. But again, those are also the breeding fish that, you know, you probably mm-hmm. want to, uh, you know, let get bigger. So, we, you know, we all have to have uh, sort of a little bit of discipline. Uh, the bigger fish aren't necessarily and usually aren't the best eating fish, uh, certainly not in the striper species, but that doesn't stop, you know, charter captains from, you know, wanting to get that sort of grip and grin photo. And, you know, those are the fish that people end up keeping, um, unfortunately. So, 
you know, I, I think it's probably a good thing. We all have to be a little bit disciplined to make sure we preserve that fishery uh, and, this, and those species. And if they come back, then, you know, sort of everyone wins. That's a really, really great conversation to have, um, Don. And I think it's a really, really important thing to, to show that we, we do take that responsibility. I think it's so, so often there's a, like a, a polarity between, you know, the science and conservation movements who are kind of pushing for these regulations and, and sort of um, other people who utilize the resource who like don't necessarily want to be told what to do. And I think, you know, we need to have people, you know, like yourself who are obviously, you know, enjoy going out there and catching your fish to say, you know what, we've come up with a strategy that's going to be the best thing for everybody. And, and that means at the moment, like, this is, this is what we're going to do because, you know, I want to keep hunting. I want to still keep catching yeah. my fish. And, and that means. hundred you percent. Know, yeah. And I, I remember okay. that feeling like, you know, I, I, when I got into spearfishing, of course, like well, the first thing you want to do is go out there and try and catch the biggest fish because you kind of want to prove to yourself, you know, and there's that sort of the trophy sort of thing, you know, and then very quickly you realize, well, wait a second, it, as you're saying, if everybody does this, we're going to end up with nothing left. Yeah. And, and I remember that feeling of going out there and finding a big school of, uh, we call them Mulloway in, in Australia and, you know, there's, there's a couple of really, really big ones in there in school. And I made that decision to take one of the smaller fish in the school. You know, they're better eating. And I just didn't need to take the bigger fish anymore. You know, you kind of like I'm past that. You know, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to impress anybody. I feel like I've achieved something in my life because I got to a point where I don't have to do that. And I think that's a, that's a good progression for the sport to take. A hundred percent, especially, you know, if we expand beyond spearfishing and talk about hunting, you have that big, you know, well, trophy hunting. Well, what's trophy? I mean, everyone's trophy is sort of a little bit different, right? I mean, some people, the trophy is a bigger, older, uh, you know, animal that may not be breeding anymore, that may still be competitive with the herd. So, you know, getting the bigger, older species or animal out of a, a herd, let's say elk, you actually may be doing the right thing in terms of the science in terms of the conservation. So each sort of discipline has a different way that we all have to look at it. And some has gotten sort of a negative connotation, uh, but it may not actually be as negative because, uh, you know, people are sort of looking at it one way and it's become a marketing push to be against, you know, that kind of hunting. Whereas, mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I don't know that there's anything wrong with, you know, the, the idea of quote unquote trophy hunting. If you're going after the big, your old, older uh, that's a breeder uh in fish uh that may be different than an you know, older club be breeder may be compared to diversity by take quote unquote trophy so it, it's an interesting thing to look at because we always sort of look at things away uh but but across the entire spectrum of you know harvesting your own animals there, there's so many different nuances that we could look at yeah, and yeah, yeah, I think you're right there. And I, I guess the, the what's important for me is we make the most informed decision. You know, like we if we've we've got um, like people want to hunt, uh, and I, I totally get that. I think with um, the power to hunt, we also need to take the responsibility to do it in the best way. You know, and that means you know, like you're not going to just take a random shot at something. No. Right. The last thing you ever want to do is injure an animal um, and, and just have it sort of, you know, go off and, and die somewhere. That's, to me, that is the, one of the worst things that we could, we could do, you know, killing something unnecessarily, you know, for the, you know, because we, are, we have ill prepared. I don't think is a, is a great thing. It's not a good thing for the sport. It's not a great thing for the, the, for the, for us. It's not a great thing for the environment. We need to take, you know, the, the steps to better ourselves so that we, we can be effective with what we do. And that also means like being um, as responsible as we can with the information that we have. So I think it's, it's really good to hear that, you know, you are right behind, you know, pushing that, that science-based management. A hundred percent. And I think, you know, again, I think today many people view hunters not that way when honestly they really are that way. Uh, you know, they are utilizing those resources. They are thinking about it. They are contributing back to those resources. And, uh, because of some of the natural conflict in the world in which we live and sort of the mentalities of these things. Uh, you know, I, I look at many hunters as sort of the, you know, leaders in conservation. Again, whether that be fishing, whether that be spearfishing, whether that be, you know, more conventional big game hunting. Uh, 
uh, you know, there, there is so much there. I don't think hunters are often viewed that way, even though, in my opinion, there's some other people on the leading edge of, of that science and of that conservation. Yeah, yeah, they definitely, look, they, they definitely can be. And I think, you know, we have to be careful not to alienate different sides here, you know, like, yep. I'm, you know, from a, a marine science perspective, um, you know, our scientists can't be in the water uh, all the time, you know, they need to be crunching the numbers, they need to be doing the lab work, and they need to be working cohesively with, you know, the, the people who, who are out there and, and spearfishing. I think, you know, we need to listen to both sides. Like the the the, the scientists need to listen to the, the the information that the you know that our spear fishermen are giving them. You know that anecdotal information leads to to great leads uh, in understanding. Um, and then vice versa, when the scientists could say, "Hey, look, you know this is probably how things need to do," and you know maybe we should give it a rest there or we change the size limits. There needs to be equal support on both sides, and and that comes into recognizing that we. we we all want the same kind of thing from our environment. You know, that's for it to be as healthy as possible so that we can still live in connection with it. Mm. Something Don and I have talked about several times is that, uh, you know, in, and I've heard you say it plenty of times, Don, to other people too, is that we're our own worst enemy um, in hunting and fishing and everything else. And um, it takes people, it takes leaders being critical of ourselves and understanding that, uh, there's a bigger picture um, that that is, uh, you know, for for uh, the risk of being cheesy, um, it's about conservation for the future and uh, yeah. making sure that we can enjoy this for the rest of our lives and that our kids can enjoy it too. Um, we um, we we would like to go ahead and talk about Lucas, um, how people in the U.S. can uh, hook up with you and take some of these classes. Obviously, these classes are super beneficial. Um, we, we, we want to certainly, uh, carve out some time for you explaining how people can, uh, jump in with you, take some of these classes and get some of this perspective that you obviously brought to half our team. I'll, I'll go ahead and say, I definitely want to jump on one of these classes with you now, um, after hearing this, but, um, you know, it, it's, uh, let, let's talk about how we can do that. So if I want to take a class with you, what's the best way to do it? Cool. Yeah. And again, it doesn't matter if you, if you're interested in free diving and spearfishing or, or you just want to challenge your own mind and learn all the techniques for like fortifying, you know, yourself through highly stressful situations. Um, the course that we're running at the moment uh, online is, is a really, really comprehensive sort of base course on, on that breath hold physiology and psychology. And that does all that kind of stuff. It's not necessarily tailored to just spearfishing or just free diving. It's, it is that sort of thing. You can go um, to my, my website, uh, which is the underwater um, or, and flick me an email through uh, to info at the underwater Academy. Um, that's probably the best way to, to contact me there. Um, or uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm running online classes a couple of times a week. Uh, increase that if we, we get the demand for it. Um, but yeah, I mean, we run them by, by Zoom, same like as we're doing now. So it's sort of, it's face to face, it's tailored. Uh, I get you to set up your video so I can watch what happens and give you feedback. Uh, I write down and, and analyze your times and all that sort of thing. So you need to sort of set yourself a little time um, to sit down and and have that online interaction. Uh, yeah, the best way is to just head through my um, the website uh, or alternatively, you can have a look at Instagram, which is the Underwater Academy on, on Instagram. The Underwater Academy, awesome. Um, Davis, anything you want to leave us with uh, before we wrap this thing up, um, being that, that this is part of your domain here? Uh, nothing on that note. I mean, it's all very informative and Lucas, thank you so much for taking the time. I have a little asterisk. The, the book I was referring to is James Nestor, not Brad. So James Nestor, and it was deep, the, the free diving renegade science and what the ocean tells us about ourselves is what it was. So, and it was awesome book and it's a short read. Good deal. Don, you were the other one on the class with Lucas. Uh, anything you want to leave us with? No, listen, I, like, like I said, for you know, those who are listening in, uh, want to learn how to put cells, even if you're not maybe quite at the point where you're going to try free diving. Uh, I, I think you'll get a lot out of this to integrate into other aspects of your life or your outdoorsmanship. Uh, so that, I, I thought it was very cool. I look forward to doing it. And again, I, I as a, a learner who just sort of learns by doing, I was amazed what I was able to get from it 
uh, again, being halfway around the world, being online, uh, you know, it, it, it still moved my knowledge exponentially. So I, I thought it was a really cool format. You did a really good job explaining it as well, Luke. It's not, you know, there's people who can do and people who can teach. And, you know, you're, you're one of the rare people that seems to be able to do both. And it was it was really helpful. Awesome. So um, what I'm also hearing is that we probably need to plan a field ethos trip to Australia. Australia, for sure. Um, maybe a 2021 Australia trip to do some free diving with Lucas. And, and uh, um, Lucas, if, you, uh, if you're ever looking at coming to the U.S., you better not do it without dropping us a line so that we can uh, show you a good time when you get here. Thank you for yeah. taking the time to jump on the podcast with us tonight. Um, and hopefully we can do this again. I think there's still a lot that we have to talk about um, that, that we can kind of unpack with this stuff. And, and so I think there's probably a, uh, that I guess maybe the first time that I've, that I've thought this in one of these podcasts, but there's definitely more to, more to talk about. And maybe we need a chapter two on this one. Well, I, I want to unlock the time and, you know, Papua New Guinea without any gear. I mean, I, I want to hear about that one uh, in, yeah. in much greater detail. Yeah, I'll take you on one of those trips, Don. <laughs> I'm in. I'm in. All right, guys. Well, thank you all so much. Lucas, thank you so much. I know that uh, being halfway around the world, um, you know, we, we are obviously on different time zones and we appreciate you uh, taking the time to sit down and talk with us. And we hope that you and your, uh, your loved ones stay healthy um, and that we can, uh, next time we talk, that we're talking um, in uh, face-to-face because there's no travel restrictions and everybody is, is past the current current state of affairs so good luck and and thanks again thanks so much guys thank you guys be well thanks for listening to the field ethos podcast subscribe for updates on all future episodes you can follow us on social at field ethos journal and don't forget to visit fieldethos.com for stories and interviews from leading voices in the outdoor community